Thank you. Um, thanks, Rakesh, for the invitation. I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here. I missed three trains. My computer crashed. I'm not really sure what slides I've got here. I think it's a draft from about three days ago. But we'll give it a go. Um, I'm going to start, because it's early in the morning, with a quiz question. Can anybody tell me who this is? Tesla. That's right. And I'll give you a second to read that. He was talking about a disruptive technology in... 1926, something called electricity. And he, I believe, predicted the Internet of Things, if you read that carefully. What he's talking about there is that one day, through electricity, through television, through telephony, we will be able to connect everything to everything. And, unlike Steve Jobs, I haven't got a pocket, if you've seen the film. You can put it in your pocket. So very prophetic. There are a lot of people out there claiming they invented the Internet of Things. I really think it was this chap um, 90 years ago. And if we look today, according to Gartner, by 2020, there will be 25 to 30 billion interconnected devices on the Internet of Things. The key feature of all these things and this idea that we're at the cusp, according to the World Economic Forum, of the Fourth Industrial Revolution is the ability to connect in real time with geolocation to all of these devices. Right now, I could change the central heating or the temperature of my boiler from my phone here. I want to talk about the Internet of Living Things. So, how do we connect all living things? Can we even do that? This is DNA. Just a great talk about. This is a genomic session, but I've made the assumption that not many people know much about DNA. DNA is the source code of all living systems. And the degree of complexity from very simple... A source code, the source code is GTAC, the four DNA bases. In a human, we have three billion. In a virus like flu or HIV or HPV, we have tens of thousands. In bacteria, which I'm going to focus on today, we have several million. When we talk about Watson and the excellent presentation and Kerry's talk later about large-scale whole population genomics, you're talking about the the uh, right-hand side of this slide. If you can access the source code, as we just heard with cancer there, we can determine what it is. Is it diseased or healthy? Is it harmful? Is it good for us? Now, what I'm going to talk about is connecting DNA to a platform that allows us to have real-time information of DNA. Okay, I'm not sure what this slide is. Oh, I do. We're all connected. Everything we do is connected to DNA, from our food chain, our water, to the people, to the connections we make, to the handshakes we make today, to the environment, and to our microbes. Inside us are 100 trillion organisms. At one level, we're merely a vehicle for these bugs. And there's a whole new hot area of science about inventorying your gut and why that's important and I'll touch on that later. So today for whole population genomics where we are if you look at the computer revolution over the last 30 years we've seen how we moved from mainframe computing to desktop to mobile, to wearables. I've got a glucose sensor on, but I'm not even going to... After the disaster I've had this morning, I'm not even going to pretend to do a live demo. The large population genomics happens today in central laboratories. These mainframe genomic computers have really catalyzed and brought about what people are talking about, the genomics Big Bang. Oxford Nanopore has developed small 
portable, field deployable, direct electronic measurement systems that require very little chemistry. The vision 12 years ago when we set this company up was to do exactly what you can do with a blood glucose finger stick. Small prick, apply, get some information that's useful to you. Answer your biological question. I'm going to pass this round. I lost one in China last week. It's got my name on it. This is a DNA sequencer. This has the power of a desktop instrument. It's powered from a laptop. All the software to run it and the power comes from the laptop. I am going to very briefly tell you how the science works because I can't help myself. What we do, we take the iconic double strand of DNA, we singulate it, we pass it through a hole, this is where the nanopore piece comes in, that is one ten thousandth the size of a human hair. It's a little chemical battery that we set this device up in, the electronic piece, as the four bases, G, T, A, C, different shape, different charge, pass through the hole. We have a small voltage and we measure current and we see a change in current. That current is a millionth the amount of current flowing through a light bulb. We can in real time read that current and provide sequence information in real time. The large scale whole population genomic systems are batch based. Sample preparation can take a day or a week and then they run for eight to 10 days. They're doing big, big game projects. That's a top down approach. These platforms will broaden and open up the ability for everybody and anybody to be able to do DNA sequencing. And given the limited time, I'm going to talk exclusively about bugs and superbugs. So, in 1942, does anybody know who Albert Alexander is? He was 43 years old. He got scratched on his face with a rose in Oxford, fortunately. And there was Flory, Heatley, Chain and Fleming who injected him over four days with penicillin. And he recovered. He was the first patient and we entered the antibiotic era. We might now be about to leave it. And we were warned. The warning was pretty stark. Within three years, drug-resistant strains of penicillin emerged. Overuse and overprescription of antibiotics is a major threat to us. Two years ago, the O'Neill report came out, and it predicts by 2050 antimicrobial resistance will be the biggest killer in developed countries. And it all comes down to overprescription and overuse. And how many people are really good at not taking too many antibiotics because they know us? Any show of hands? That's great. Good. I'll tell you why it's not going to help you in a minute. Um, but it's not just people with infections hip operation, just knee operation, you know, anything. You are going, we are entering a very dangerous period. And Mother Nature will make a correction. What we are doing, it's basically asymmetric warfare. We are providing the microbes, the pathogens, with a roadmap on how to become drug resistant. The reason those of you who are great are not taking them, it's good, but it's in the food chain. And it has to stop. If it does not, we're all going to be in so much trouble. And there's another problem. The number of drugs in the pipeline right now is 50. Maybe five of those might make it out the other side. Maybe. So something has to change or there will be a correction. We will, we will see the end of the antibiotic era. TB, drug resistance in India and China is at epidemic levels. I'm not here to frighten you, but it is quite scary. It's really scary. Multi-drug resistant strains have emerged. 
little bit of publicity, you've got them in iron. Public Health England and the Wellcome Trust have partnered up with some uh, clinicians in Mumbai. It takes six weeks to do a TB drug-resistant test today. With the Minine, they're down to three hours, but we think we can do it in 45 minutes. Most importantly, we think we can do it out in the field. If you can find a drug-resistant strain, you can contain it, you change everything. This was an interesting one, the use case of the Minine. There was a fungal infection in intensive care. It was tracked, I can't say too much about this, it was tracked to a healthcare worker who'd just come back from northern India. And she'd brought a new resistant strain of candida, fungal infection. We all have it, it's fine, but when you're in intensive care and you're immune compromised, you're in a lot of trouble. And they were able to isolate this strain, and it's a whole new strain. This is the real power of real time. Um, so... If you could see this, what you would see, this is Ebola. It started just across the border from Sierra Leone. There was a wedding. It was carried back, and then it was carried up to the capital, and so it spread. This is an animated retrospective GIF from the World Health Organization, and it shows how it spread. It's a retrospective two years later. If this happened today, you would isolate that. Maybe this is a better slide. You could have contained it there because you've seen it, You've registered it. There are over several hundred strains of the mutated Ebola virus that were retrospectively analysed. You would be able to track it in real time. So I'm almost out of time. Antibiotic stewardship is receiving a lot of attention from governments around the world. Public health policy pushed on by the UK O'Neill report it's really getting organisations to wake up. But I don't think it's going to be enough. I think we're all going to have to take control. And I think, as the superbugs rise, I'm not going to pass this round. Uh, this is a smidgen. It's like a blood glucose single use, drop of blood. You'll be able to screen at home. In order to prevent the rise of antibiotics at the point of prescription, you have to determine if it's suitable for an antibiotic. We have to completely reduce it, not just in humans, in livestock as well. And I believe this platform, I'm supposed to give a bold prediction, this platform will mean that you will all have to start getting involved in this fight back. And it's not just infectious diseases. Great talk about liquid biopsy a few minutes ago. Cancer as well. We can all start screening at home. We have to decentralise. The healthcare systems cannot cope. It will all fall apart and you will all become familiar with DNA information. And don't be afraid. AI, a consultant on the back end of that, can provide a report maybe to your healthcare provider. We strongly believe, and you will see in the next five years, decentralised testing of your genetics beyond healthcare, lifestyle, your microbiome. I haven't got time to talk about that today. Go Google it. Friendly bacteria. There's a bacteria called Christensen, which is called the thin gene, thin bacteria. Helps you lose weight. This is all emerging, and we're at the beginning of that journey. From farm to fork, from reservoir to tap, these are all sources of infection in the farm. Livestock, home testing, if you have a young child and they're ill, temperature, you will test at home. And this will come because we now have real time. Last slide's not here. I would have shown you the, uh, one of the shots from the film Gattaca where a drop of blood is used as your oyster card. That vision is here today. We can read genetics that quickly. I'm going to stop at that point and I want to thank the organisers and I want to thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.